There's something that Paul called on the Corinthians to do that as far as I can tell, no church full of Christian people has ever been able to do. Simple as that. It's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, at first blush, this seems utterly impossible. There's just no way. It, if not impossible, we have never achieved it. I don't think the Corinthians did either. For one thing, we wouldn't even necessarily all have the same taste when time comes to go out to dinner. You know, Some might prefer this food, some might prefer that food, that restaurant, and what we often do is we compromise in order that we can be together and do things together. But being of the same mind, same judgment, uh, I'm not so sure. Now, Paul is not a dreamer, he's not an idealist, so it seems apparent to me that there is something in, in this that we are missing, and it's worth taking a little time to talk it over. I will admit that Paul's introduction to the Corinthians is long-winded, because this verse 10 comes at the end of his introduction to this letter. However, there's a method in, in his madness if you understand where he is going and what the problems were that prompted this letter to be written. This verse makes all kinds of sense, and the stuff that leads up to it helps us understand what it's all about. He starts out, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1. Verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. That's just an interesting little sidelight. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Sosthenes was the scribe who actually put this letter on paper. Every, the impression I get is that it may be that, uh, that, well, in fact it is, I think, that Paul rarely wrote anything in his own handwriting. He used what they call an amnuensis, amnuensis, I think it is, which basically means a, a secretary, scribe, somebody taking dictation. And I can imagine he drove those guys absolutely nuts, no, you know, realizing what Paul is like. And when you understand there were no word processors, uh, once you put the word on, 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 on parchment, it was there. Uh, they didn't use lead pencils with erasers. I mean, this stuff is, you know, comes out of a certain milieu. And, and as a result of that, they're not able to go back and say, oh, I didn't mean to say that quite that way, and reshape what it is that they're saying. Okay, Sosthenes, who I think is sitting there writing this down, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice, he's writing to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, which is, I think, an affirmation of the Corinthian church. You know, he's saying, you people are called to be saints. And also, he says, with all who in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's our Lord. He is theirs. He is ours. In other words, the letter was actually, in Paul's mind, going to reach beyond the Corinthians. And I'm certain, it certainly is obviously it has, because here we are, you know, all these generations later, going through what Paul said, trying to understand what he's driving at. I thank my God always on your behalf... For the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. This is pretty complimentary, I think. He, he says, I, I give thanks to you, for, to God, always for you people. You are enriched by God in the things that you say and in all the knowledge. And listen to what he, how he goes on. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that, you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also shall confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the two words you want to take special note of here, not to his words, but two ideas, are affirmation and respect. Before Paul tease off on these people, which he is about to do. And Paul can be very sarcastic, and he gets sarcastic. But before he does it, he wants to affirm them, he wants to establish the relationship with them, and he wants to show them some respect. This is something that all too often gets neglected when we get involved in arguments and what have you, and bickerings and what in, in church. 
and in talking about doctrines and so forth. We, one of the rules on the CEM and Friends Forum is civility. We have to show each other respect. I don't tolerate people who get on there and jump on people who don't. Okay, Paul is headed for some sharp correction. But before he can go there, he has to confirm that these people are saints, they are gifted, and they are sincere, and they are dedicated. And if you don't show some respect and affirmation before you offer criticism, the criticism is almost certainly going to be taken badly. So Paul sets out to address a problem, having confirmed that these are saints in his eyes. Now we're to verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Notice, speak the same thing. Think the same thing? That would be a little difficult, but he goes on with that. That there be no divisions among you, not some, no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now it seems obvious to me here that there are boundaries that have to be considered. I already mentioned the fact, do we all have to like the same restaurant? No, of course not. Uh, do we have to have the same taste in food? Of course not. Some of us like Mexican, some of us like Oriental, some of us like whatever they make in Texas, you know. Uh, some of us are happy with a hamburger. We're just different in our taste. Is, is, can, do we, can we have that kind of a variance in judgment? Of course we can. There's hardly any question about that. We make allowances for one another's preferences in order that we go out to dinner someplace together and share the, the, our food sometimes. Now, what I want is not as important as the fellowship that we have. The question is, though, what are the boundaries within which we are supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment? Because outside those boundaries, obviously, we don't have to. We, 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 get, we get along. We give, we take, and so forth, and we share. So where are the boundaries? How are they established? And how do we relate to them? My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Now, that really is kind of a strange circumstance to exist, isn't it, in the church? What it suggests is that there were differences in style between Paul and, and Peter. I, I have no doubt of that. In fact, you pick any two men who are in Christ's service, the differences in style are going to be there. I got my style, Larry's got his style, you know, so on it goes. We are just different. So this was the pre situation prevailing in the church, though, to where people were dividing up into camps almost along these lines. Then he says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's speaking to the people who were basically saying, well, I'm, I'm of Paul. I prefer to, follow, you know, to listen to Paul and to follow Paul's method. Paul could be sarcastic, so it was necessary for him to confirm this relationship on the standing of the parties he's talking to before he tees off. He goes on to say, I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest somebody out there would say I baptized in my own name. And I'll bet somebody did. You know, it's just the way it goes. You, I don't care how careful you are. The, the ninth chapter of this same book will be an excellent illustration of that. We're not going there today. Where, where Paul did everything he could in Corinth to be accused, to not be accused that he was after their money. And he still got accused of being after their money. So, you know, what can you do? He said, I did also baptize the house of Stephanus. Besides, I don't know if I baptized anybody else or not. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, how hard is this? The cross of Christ, not with wisdom. Now, when you understand the, the usage of the word at the time, the Greeks were very big on rhetoric, very big on uh, the, whole, the structure of arguments and all this kind of stuff. It was a feature of human wisdom. Paul says, I didn't come down here with this. I came with simplicity. I preached the cross of Christ. Now, the cross of Christ is, in, is used here is what I call a verbal icon. A verbal icon, well, we're all becoming familiar with icons. We've all got computers nowadays, and, and even all of the grandparents have got computers, and, and they email because they like to get their grandparents, grandkids' pictures 
you know, and share stuff back and forth. It's becoming a very powerful part of our society today and has really taken off. Well, if you work with computers, and I remember I, was, I stopped one day while I was working on a document, and I started, decided to count the icons on my screen. It seemed like there were over 40 icons on that screen. The icon is there like the little one that's shaped like a printer to tell you that if you click on this, it activates a sequence of events. It probably, if you looked at the code that was written to actually make that happen, it's probably half a page of lines of code that would get down to it, all of which, if it weren't for an icon, which is uh, a, a command that executes the whole line of stuff, it would take you a half an hour to type in all the code uh, in order to print a document. So we use shortcuts. There's the little printer up there. There's one that you can use for spell check. There's, uh, it just goes on and on with the different things you can do on that screen. It's amazing when, when you see all of them. Well, what you have in the Bible are what I call verbal icons, where they are shortcuts, short, shorthand, for telling you about a whole range of stuff. And the cross of Christ comes into this particular thing. For Paul, what it means is what today we would call the passion of Jesus Christ, the passion story. It is the events that took place on that Passover day when Jesus was killed. It would include the Last Supper. It would include the betrayal of Judas. It would include the suffering of that long night in which Jesus was humiliated, spit on, beaten, and, and, and so forth as he went all the way through. He's judged falsely. Uh, he gets down to the next day, and of course he's whipped. He's nailed to a cross. He dies there, has a sword thrust into his side, and so on. It's, this is what Paul is talking about as it applies to the sacrifice for our sins, Christ becoming a substitute for us and the things that we have done in our life. He took our burdens on him. He died in our place. And because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we are able to be resurrected in the, in the time of the kingdom. That's, all that is subsumed in this expression the cross of Christ. Okay, it included, as I said, the suffering and death of Jesus, and that's what Paul means. Now, is it important, just as an illustration of what I'm talking about here today, whether Jesus was crucified on an upright stake or a cross with a bar across it, you know, that goes up in the traditional form of the cross, or if it was like a T with the crossbar put at the top of the stake as opposed to being across it, is this important? Is it a part of the cross of Christ? No, not really. Paul never discusses it, never raises the question, never even brings it as an issue. The comparison of the cross to a pagan sun wheel is pointless, I think, except to make the, it may be a massage the vanity of the one who's making the comparison. There is, and this is important, there is no consciousness of paganism in people who sing or speak of the cross. For them, the cross is an icon for the death of Christ. It's just as simple as that. And this is the thing that Paul is trying to say to these people. I didn't come in here with a lot of arguments about uh, uh, some kind of pagan symbols of this, that, or the other thing. I didn't come in here arguing about a lot of details. I came to you with the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He shed his blood, and we partake of his, the, the symbols of his shed blood and his broken body at the Passover service. Here's the thing I think is important. When you sing a song that refers to the cross, what God hears is what you mean by it, not what somebody else meant by it. I think this is a really important distinction that got lost somewhere back in our tradition as people got wrapped up in what I call radical anti-paganism, where if the pagans ever did it, you can't do it which means since the pagans ate breakfast, you're stuck. You have to get out, start off your day without it. Anyhow, I indulge in a little of Paul's sarcasm. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, he goes on. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now, you don't have to be a scholar to be saved. This is something which, I don't know why, but it gets lost every once in a while in people's arguments about theological matters. 
You do not have to know Hebrew or Greek in order to achieve salvation, to be forgiven of your sins. It's utterly unnecessary. Down through the years, hundreds, thousands of people have come to know God without any knowledge of Greek or Hebrew. And I think that should be apparent to anybody. In fact, you could achieve salvation if you never had encountered anything except the good old King James Bible with all of its mistakes and, 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 and oddities and peculiarities. It would do the job if you'd sit down and read it. So you don't have to know these things. Language is a tool for conveying meaning. And it is the meaning that is important and not the words. That's why Paul will write and say, don't get involved in strifes of words. And I think I mentioned before about a fellow I knew who in the process of trying to establish the time that the original Passover was taken had to write a book nearly the size of the title of telephone book in order to explain all this stuff. It shouldn't be necessary. And the Greek and the Hebrew words are not necessary. You can find what you need to know because God will look at what you mean and what you intend when you do these things, not at what the language that you happen to be speaking at the time says for you. Okay. The development of convoluted doctrinal statements, and they are myriad in every, every religion, every church, they are merely a vain show, pure and simple. Paul goes on in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs. Greeks look for wisdom, reasoning explaining of stuff. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to the Greeks, but to those whom God has called, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, Christ, the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God, <laughs> that's a funny way to put it, isn't it? The foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. It transcends everything we think and everything we do. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Boy, ain't that the truth. He goes on to say, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world, despised things, things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. You know, this was, uh, we got beat around the head and shoulders with this in college, in Ambassador College, as people tried to help us understand that we were not some elite, we weren't somebody where they were being put up on a pedestal. They, we, you know, time after time I'd get reminded by one person or another of what this passage says. God did not pick you because you were smart. God did not choose you because you were noble. God did not choose you because you were a particularly able and good person. In fact, he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong, the lowly things and the despised things to nullify the things that are. Why? So that no one can boast before him. And I, I had to think about that. You know, I'm just a country boy from the hills of Arkansas. I wasn't anybody special. I certainly was not of noble birth. I was born on a farm up in, uh, in the Ozarks in January 7, 1934, uh, with a foot of snow on the ground. The doctor rode the horse out there to, to help my mother give, me, give birth to me. It was a poor family. We grew up poor. And when we got, up, you know, got on up to the place where Allie and I got married, we got married poor. We lived poor for a long time. It's just, you know, God doesn't look to uh, those things. He wants people who understand what it is and who know what life is. And, uh, that's, and he wants to be able, when all is said and done, to say, now I want you to understand, this guy is nothing. I'm everything. And that's the lesson that Paul's trying to get across to the Corinthians on this particular occasion because of the way they were doing things. It's because of him, he said, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom uh, from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, it's, that came, comes almost from Jeremiah, who says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the rich man glory in his wealth. Let him that glories glory in this, that he knows me, that he understands me, and what kind of a God I am. 
So it is in Paul's conclusion to this chapter here that, this cha that the picture starts shaping up. It is vanity and self-importance that lies at the root of the problems that divide. That's what Paul's on about. Shall I say it again? It is vanity and self-importance that lies at the root of the problems that divide. And that's what he is saying when he says, Now I want you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. But where are the boundaries of this unity? Because in literal terms, what Paul asks for is impossible. You know, we could be, you know, know each other, we could know each other for a whole lifetime and share conversation after conversation and we'll never ever be of the same mind and the same judgment in everything. I think we all know that. But there is a core that if we don't hold to it, we will wander all over the landscape. What does Paul say the core is? Christ and Him crucified. The cross of Christ. What He came for, what He did, and what He established. It is this core belief that establishes the essential boundaries of what we are supposed to think the same about, teach the same things, believe the same things, hold to the same things. Paul identifies it as the cross of Christ. Now, it is of at least passing interest that this is the one thing that virtually all Christendom believes. I think you could make every church in Smith County uh, maybe one or two exceptions here or there, but every single one of them, when you say the cross of Christ, will talk about and mean the events that took place on that night and the next day as Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead for our eternal life. This belief just goes straight. You be Catholic, be you Protestant, be you Baptist, be you Methodist, you know, Church of Christ, you name it. This is one thing that we all hold in common. Except, of course, for the, for there's a, for some fringe elements who think a spaceship is coming for them, and uh, that's a different matter altogether. According to Paul, the underlying problem is human ego. Simple as that. He addresses it another level, another way, in the 12th chapter of, the, of his letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is not, not asking anything unreasonable. And you understand what God has done for you, when you understand what God has provided for you, that you present your body to Him as a, as a living sacrifice is reasonable. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I, I can't think of very many things more challenging than that. Do not be conformed to the world. Because the world rewards conformity, and the world punishes nonconformity. And everything about us is designed, it seems like, to be, cause us to conform to something. And his point is, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let society determine who you are and what you're going to be and what your values are. You want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does that happen? You know, it's pretty hard to... to describe this for a person, but I do know for a fact that for me, the transforming or renewing of my mind has been a, a lifetime project, and it's come about from the reading of the Bible. And uh, Nancy Percy in her book, uh, um, let's see, what did she title that book? I've forgotten it right now, but it's a, a, exceptional, pardon? Total Truth, right. She has a section at the beginning of that book that was very in, in, instructive to me. He says, what people have tended to do is they begin to develop what they call it, what she calls an experiential religion. In other words, it's based on experience. I have experienced God, and therefore that experience can transcend even Scripture. You'd be surprised at how many people, their whole religious life is based upon the fact that they had an experience at some time. They experience Christ, they experience Christ, and so forth. But what Paul is talking about is the renewal that comes from the one source of total truth, the Bible. Because without the Bible, we don't know anything. We don't even know, you know, that some people want to play around with the New Testament 
And they'll, they, I, this has really been incredible, incredible to me to know this has happened with people who begin to deny that uh, Jesus Christ, they say the, new, the Roman Catholic Church got control of the New Testament and they changed this to suit themselves, you know, whatever. And the point is that once you come to that conclusion, you have no evidence that Jesus Christ lived, taught, what he taught when he taught, that he died for in your place, no basis for the Lord's Supper, for the communion service, no basis for believing in his resurrection, no basis for Christianity at all. And it's shocking to see how people, how many people go down that road. And they go down that road all times. Well, I had an experience with God, and it trumps things that the Bible tells them to do. Now, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is good, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I, I can't take your word for that. I can take the Bible for it because it is the testimony of men who experienced God. And so I look at that and I learn this is what the will of God is. It's not what I feel. It's not based upon my impressions. It's based upon what I am concretely told by Jesus Christ. Okay. I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. This is fundamental to our being able to work together, cooperate, accomplish, to do anything in Christ's name, is that each of us has got, must not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Because inevitably, you know, people find some new truth. They find something. Or it may be because they had an experience with God. I remember a gentleman, as all of you know, I believe in tithing. I believe it's the law of God. I believe we should do it. I met a gentleman once who uh, had stopped in a roadside restaurant, had a meal, walked out to his car. And just as he was getting ready to get in his car, suddenly an angel appeared to him and told him he ought to pay tithes. And so he started paying tithes based upon that vision. And he asked me, was that of God? I said, probably not. Because God will not normally send you an angel to tell you something that's already in the book. Remember the illustration of the rich man and Lazarus, where he says, oh, send Lazarus back to my brothers if they don't come to this terrible place. And he says, let them hear Moses and the prophets. If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't listen if someone came from the dead. And it's only a small step for someone to tell you you ought to do something that you ought to do. To the next thing he tells you is something else. Once you begin to trust this angel, as opposed to trusting the Bible, you're in trouble. Pure and simple. So anyway, this was drummed into me a long time ago, and I have to come back and remind myself every once in a while, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. If you do, it's going to step up and it's going to bite you. Most of the divisions in the churches arise because someone has decided to know the unknowable. Shall I say that again? Most of the division, and the Greek word for division is heresy, arise because someone has decided that he knows what is not knowable and has completely lost the ability to respect other people. I'll have to explain. Differences in opinion are inevitable. They're going to happen. Late in the third century, there was a man named Arius who came to the belief that Jesus was a created being. He accepted the pre-existence of Jesus. He believed Jesus was the God of the Old Testament. He was the one that spoke to Moses and from the burning bush and all that. He had no problem with that. That's a standing Christian belief. He could hardly deny it in the face of the documents, in fact, that the church had accepted as canonical at the time. But he argued that before Genesis 1-1, before any of the scripture was written, Jesus was created, and that only the Father was uncreated, and eternal. Now, I can see God turning to Arius and saying, excuse me, where were you standing when all this took place? I didn't notice you being there. He said that to Job, remember, after all, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, who do you think you are? And what Arius was doing was trying to establish as doctrine something that there is, it is utterly impossible because, to prove there, are, there is no testimony from a witness to tell us it took place. So he was out of mind on this. Now, so, you know, and, if, and again, the next question is, those things that are not revealed belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to us. We have a big enough trouble doing the things we're told to do 
without trying to figure out things that are eternal. Uh, Skip Martin, who many of you know and I were talking this morning on the phone about this very thing, about what happened before we came to Genesis 1-1 and what there will be beyond the end of everything that's revealed to us in the Bible. And it's fun to talk about what might be in this and other universes, or as C.S. Lewis said, this and other worlds. But you have to remember you don't know. And whenever you start trying to formulate a doctrine, now when you formulate it as a doctrine, apply it as a doctrine, you are requiring other people to believe it as well. Because that moves into the area of we all got to speak the same thing. And when you start claiming to know what is not there to be known, you're on a very bad course, and it's where this type of thing gets, you know, gets so much division that comes up from time to time. We have no testimony as to anything before Project Earth was initiated beyond the fact that God made everything we can see. But Arius elevated his opinion to truth. He knew what he had no way of knowing. And that word truth, it's a good word, it's very meaningful, but it can bite you. And it commonly does. As people decide that something is truth when it's nothing more than their opinion, nothing more than guesswork, nothing more than they kind of think they put together a list of scriptures that in their mind point to it. In other words, you know, the word extrapolate is interesting in this regard because it's what a lot of people do. If you're on working on a graph and you find you can actually put dots on the paper in a line that suggests to you that anything that happens between those dots probably belongs on that line. Extrapolation is when you run the line beyond anything you know. And when you get out there, you can kind of make an educated guess that maybe that's, you know, the next dot will be along that line, but maybe it won't. And all your data goes in the trash can. Well, because Arius was dividing the known Christian church at that time, the Council of Nicaea developed the doctrine of Trinity as a counter and a defense against it. Uh, but at least they had the sense to call the Trinity a mystery. And I appreciate the fact that they did that because they admitted in doing so that we're dealing with something that's way beyond our ken, way beyond anything we can know. And our best understanding is they had to deal with the Father being God, the Son being God, the Holy Spirit being God, and that they're being unified, so they came up with the Trinity. As I pointed out in The Lonely God, I take it as far as I can take the concept there, uh, that essentially, uh, you know, God is, in that sense, a mystery. I prefer to use biblical terms. The, Inter Inter the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia uh, mentions and notes that the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but it's a good explanation of what is in the Bible. Okay, I prefer using uh, terminology or ideas that are in the Bible, and the, the way the Bible approaches it is family rather than trinity. There's a father, there's a son, and a family lawyer, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, and these things are one. Now, exactly how they relate, exactly how the Holy Spirit works, that's a mystery, and we are better off leaving it there. Now, I have been learned, learned to be comfortable with three little words that if everybody would just use them more often would keep us out of trouble. Some of you already know what they are. I don't know. I should rewrite the old song, you know. Three little words, I think, <laughs> that uh, everybody, where I love you, wonderful three words, but I don't know keeps us out of trouble. And all this lies behind something that Paul wrote to Titus. It's Titus chapter 3. This is a faithful saying, he said, and these things I will that you affirm constantly, that they who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are profitable to everybody. Now, isn't that a fascinating idea? Be careful to maintain good works. They help people. They work for everybody. They're profitable. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. They are unprofitable and vain. Now, what's he trying to tell us here? You know, your time is going to be a whole lot better spent working down at the soup kitchen in a mission somewhere, taking food to the hungry, being able to provide some clothing perhaps, working for Goodwill Industries or Salvation Army or wherever it is you can go to do this, to do good things for people. This is profitable to everybody. It's good. But you sit around by the hour, hour after hour after hour, with all your concordances, your computer, with your language studies and all this kind of stuff, coming up with new truth, isn't going to take you anywhere. It's unprofitable and it's vain. And then he says this, 
because it is related to this. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted, notice not is going to be, he is subverted, and sins being condemned of himself. He's self-condemned, which is a strange thing to say. Now, the word heretic does not mean that the guy has ideas or speculations that are out in left field. That doesn't mean heretic. Otherwise, we'd have to point a finger at a few people right here. We all get speculations and ideas that are out in left field from time to time. What fun to talk about them. Heretic is a Greek word that means divisive. It, for, it, for it to become divisive, it has to be made an issue, right? It has to be made an issue of truth, not mere opinion and conjecture. You know, you could sit around all day and say, well, I think so and so. But when you claim it as new truth, then you've posed a problem. Because then if your brother doesn't believe the truth, then you and he are separated over this particular issue. Arius, for it, be, for it to become divisive, it has to be an issue of truth. Arius was a stubborn heretic, not just an opinionated old man. It's important to understand that. And he made an issue out of it. I believe, if memory serves, Arius was uh, down in Alexandria. And he was a significant teacher down in Alexandria. And the church at that time, you know, the, all of the bishops of, of the church at that time, the Catholic, what we would call them Catholic bishops, there was no Catholic church at this time. All these bishops were completely independent of each other. They came together from time to time for discussions, and uh, people often talk, called the Bishop of Rome the, uh, the first among equals. But it was when Constantine came on the scene and brought the st power of the state into the picture got all the bishops together in Rome and said, you will come together with a decision on this, that the Council of Nicaea made certain decisions and declared Arius a heretic. The divisive person has decided that he knows the truth, and his truth varies from that which the church has placed within the boundaries of doctrine. Now, who decides the boundaries? Well, whenever a community of Christians get together, and they talk these things over, and they publish a doctrinal statement. They have established their boundaries. They have said, this is what this church teaches. We don't teach anything other than this. And so it's important that we keep that in mind as we teach. So uh, that's why, by the way, that I recommend to churches, they do not publish a statement of belief, but a statement of doctrine. This is what we teach. It's what the word doctrine means. We don't have, we, so you may not believe it, but that you're still welcome to, to come among us and be a, be a part of this work. Okay, the divisive person has decided he knows all this stuff. What Paul is saying, talk to him once. Try twice, then give it up. But why? Isn't perseverance a virtue? Not always. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. There are two bad things. Studies have shown that arguing with an opinionated person only makes him his belief stronger. The more you argue with him, the more he will put bricks up on the wall, the deeper he will dig the hole, and the harder it will ever be for him to turn around and look at it differently because of the longer you argue with him, the bigger is vanity, his pride gets involved in it, and he has to swallow too much to come back and say, brother, I was wrong. You're better off to leave it alone. The other bad thing is your need to argue with him Maybe your own vanity at work. It can happen. So there comes a point in time, try once, try twice, give it up, and walk away. Now I learned a curious thing about this a long time ago. Paul says it here. I, d I learned it first elsewhere and came back to Paul and realized the truth of what he was saying here. The heretic's big issue that he's making with you is not the real problem. It's funny where our things come to you. Uh, I was sitting on a rock up in Colorado with a rifle across my knees. I had taken a cartridge out of the chamber and was uh, having a candy bar and just looking out because I thought I'm out here. No deer is ever going to creep up on me where I'm at. I can see everything. And much to my surprise, a doe appeared around, behind a rock down below me down there. And I fixated on that doe because she moved forward. Another one came out behind. Another one came out behind. I held my rifle, put my candy bar down, and began to watch carefully because I thought there may be a buck with those does. Wrong. As I sat there, I suddenly saw a movement out of the corner of my eye, and I turned, and there was a really big four-pointer, four points on a side, big deer, 
uh, just looking at me with a, with a funny expression on his face, and I could only imagine it mine. And so I came or started to wheel around and, and granked a, a cartridge into the chamber and followed him with the scope and squeezed my shot off carefully just as he went behind a tree. And then he went up what I thought was a sheer bluff behind me. Apparently it wasn't because he was able to go up it. And he was lost to me. What that told me was you've got to be careful, you know, that oftentimes what you're looking at is not the important thing. And that... that they're, you've heard, you know the expression of a red herring. You drag a red herring across the pass, the bird, the bird dog is liable to go following the red herring instead of following what you're after. It, it's an important idea that just as Judas's issue, you know, they were, they, the, the, it was Mary, wasn't it, who came to Jesus and was anointed his feet with this really expensive ointment very shortly before his, his crucifixion. And Judas says, why wasn't this soul given to the poor, you know, money given to the poor? This terrible waste of that fine ointment and so forth. He wasn't worried about that, we're told in Scripture. He was a thief. His big issue had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the fact that he was a thief. Paul says, a man that has this thing going on, he is subverted, he is sinning, he is self-condemned. He thereby identified clearly what was going on with Judas. He was a thief. Just so. The issue raised by Arius was a mask for his real problem, and no one but Arius knew what it was. And if you spend a little time with him, you're just wasting your time, because in order for him to admit you're wrong over here, he's got to deal with this other thing in his life that this is covering up. And I am reasonably sure of it, and I never do try to you know, dig around to find out what it is. I just realize that arguing with the wrong issue is worse than pointless. It enables the sinner to maintain the cover for his sin longer, just that much longer, and it's not good for him. Maybe if you leave him alone, he one day will come to himself and decide that's wrong, and as a result of getting rid of this one thing over here in his life, suddenly he's able to understand again. So, once again, I come to the value of three little words. I don't know. And a friend of mine, John Robinson, who died some years ago, had another set of words he used that he liked to end arguments with. He'd just say, you may be right. He wasn't giving the guy anything. He didn't say he was right. He just said, you may be right. Even though he himself knew full well the guy wasn't right, it was just simpler than sitting there and arguing with him. So you could always tell with John when he was ready to sign off, you may be right. And I learned long since not, not to think that assumed that I had won anything. There are a few proverbs, I think, that we, you know, kind of memorized years ago that bear really repeating because they do bear on the kind of problems we're running into here. Proverbs 12, verse 15. The way of a fool seems right to him. Oh, how many times I've had to read that. The book of Proverbs makes you feel like a bloody fool so much of the time because you sit there and you read it and you know you've done these stupid things and sure enough, you have. The way of a fool seems right. So merely the fact that it seems like I'm doing the right thing has nothing to do with whether it's right or wrong. Does that make sense? Even a fool thinks that. A wise man listens to advice. A fool shows his annoyance at once. A prudent man overlooks an insult. Just let it go. Walk away from it, is what he's saying. It, and then in Proverbs 16, verse 25, There is a way that seems right to a man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. That was another lesson that I learned at hunting camp. Not in camp, but, but on a hunting trip. We got uh, a lot of snow that year, and we were trying to get up the backside of a mountain, and uh, our vehicle stalled out and went stuck, and we were there. We had to walk out. So some of the guys were walking a little faster than others of us were, and they walked out and got way ahead of us, and we walked on up the mountainside and found a road. Fortunately, that road had been beaten down, and boy, was it ever a lot easier than walking in that deep snow. So we followed the road for a while, and then we got to a place to where I could look right over here, and the main highway that we were supposed to meet people at was right down there, not very far. The road, however, went that way, and we thought for a while about, shall we cut across country here, or shall we follow the road? We decided to follow the road, and I am really glad we did, because we might have gotten down there, and it was exhausting walking that deep snow. The road wound around a little ways and wound back and forth, and we probably, I'm sure we made it back to the main highway faster than we would if we'd taken what looked like a shortcut. 
you know, there's a way that looks good. But in a, in a sense, what this, this taught me was a lot of smart people have gone down this road before I got here. I think I'll follow these smart people instead of thinking that I know all the answers to things. Proverbs 30, verse 10. Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse you and you be found guilty. Interesting. There is a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. How is that possible? How is it possible to be pure in your own eyes when you're not washed of your filth? You still got your filthiness with you. Well, I don't know. All I know is that people have got to find a way to feel right. They've got to find a way, especially if they're in a religious situation, to feel righteous before God. And I honestly believe that some people go to find their righteousness in details of the law, technicalities of doctrine, uh, issues you know, that, that make them important and, and help them to uh, you know, cover up the things that they're worried about. And so their own way looks right to them. But the problem is they haven't been washed. There is a generation... Oh, how lofty are their eyes. Their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords, their jaw like knives, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Huh. You know, and these are fundamental things that, as Christian people, you're supposed not to do. The poor, the needy, the downtrodden are people we're supposed to be helping. Paul wrote in Galatians, and you know, Paul gets this stuff from the, from the Old Testament, it's the only scriptures he had. He wrote to the Galatians, chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore that one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In other words, don't get on your high horse to straighten this person out. <coughs> Consider yourself, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he's kidding himself. Now, do we understand this? That it's awfully easy to get exalted in our own eyes. What we're being told in all this is respect one another. And this is the thing that's so often missing. I, 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 you know, we, we finally got our forum mostly ironed out in this regard. Because some, in so many internet forums, people flame one another. You know, it's, it's, it's a big forum sport. We don't allow that. You, civility is rule one on our forum. We have to show one another respect. And when you have or show contempt for a brother or a sister, you've jumped the tracks. No matter how weak they are, no matter how mistaken they are, no matter how wrong they are, respect is important. Not only respect for them, but not too much respect for yourself. And one really, a proverb that I, I wish I remembered more often than I do, it's a powerful one, it's a th in the third chapter, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Don't trust it. Don't trust your opinion. Don't trust your understanding. You may be right. And tell yourself that. I may be right, but on the other hand, maybe there's something I don't know. Maybe there's something I haven't seen. Maybe there's something of which I am not aware. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Remember not only to say, you may be right, to accept, I may be wrong. One final thought, and this is a strange proverb. It's kind of hard to understand, but it's here to be dealt with. Be not righteous over much. Neither make yourself overwise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not over much wicked. Don't be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It's hard to imagine you could be righteous over much, but apparently you can, and it's certainly true that we can make ourselves out to be wiser than we are. These are lessons I think we need to take with us down the road. That's it for today, uh, and I'll ask you to stand, and we'll ask Mark to lead us in our closing